I have joked often that uh, when I grow up, I'm going to be a preacher. <laughs> I have tried to be a teacher all my life, and um, it has taken me abroad. I've lived about 28 years abroad and uh, been back in my state of birth uh, only these last two years. I'm a McEwen, Tanishville native, uh, sing country music, and, uh, but uh, I sing Italian songs as well because my father, without my permission, took me when I was four overseas, and, and I haven't looked back since. My son is over there right now directing a group in uh, study abroad. That's what I did for a long time. And, uh, and then anyway, it's uh, great to be with you again. Normally in the spring, I'm not here. I'm on the other side of the, of the ocean. But uh, I came to babysit my 90-year-old father, if you know him. His name is Earl Edwards, and he does not need me. <laughs> He's 90 going on 70, and... Uh, uh, what did I do that for? <laughs> anyway, it's great to be with you. Um, I uh, have chosen to uh, do a little bit of introduction. And, uh, speaking to preachers, uh, this is automatic stuff that we should know. But I did look back in my particular experience, and I've preached from Mark, not always in the English language, but uh, in uh, one of the one other ones that I uh, use in Italian congregations. But uh, I found it easy to, uh, to organize thoughts or to st have jumping points in, uh, in thoughts. So let me start right here. Looks like it's going to cut part of my thing off on the bottom, but that's all right. We'll, we'll go from there. I use PowerPoints. That's the new, uh, but I'm not a master at it. There are some of you as preachers that are far better. I'm not trying to impress you with artistry here. But I, uh, I uh, am going to do two things. One, I want to do a little bit of a walkthrough of uh, introduction to Mark, simply because I saw that the other uh, speakers, uh, Brother Mike Moss and uh, Brother Burleson, and they're doing very specific topics and understand why in this kind of a uh, situation you do it. But walking where Jesus walked, that means all of Palestine. <laughs> all of Palestine in 40 minutes, okay. Uh, I wouldn't be the one, I've told Gary, wherever he is, that really the guy that should be here should be Dr. Dale Manor. He's the archeologist, best friend of mine in the years that I served over in Greece, and we had many groups together going all over the Pauline uh, sites, Corinth, Ephesus, etc. Those are my cup of tea, because over time I've done about 45 uh, groups abroad in those various places. But Israel is so dear to me. So at the end, I'm going to stop with a prayer. My uh, good friend Rami Abu Hanna, who's an uh, Anglican um, guide, speaks English very well. I don't speak uh, Hebrew or Arabic, so I need guides in those lands. He has been out of work during the COVID years, has a wife and small child, and then again now because of the war, it started on October 7th of this past year. It's, uh, uh, just remember uh, how Jesus looked out from Jerusalem on, on all the people, not the buildings. The buildings were doing fine, thank you very much, but uh, the people, and he cried, he sobbed, you know, uh, people that need God. Uh, so pray for Israel and pray for the Palestinians. Uh, all of the above. Can't go there right now, but I hope that you go there sometime. That's my prayer, because walking down the Mount of Olives and hearing uh, the cacophony, the sounds of uh, conflicting monotheistic faiths, the call to prayer five times a day of, of the Muslims, and then hymns, uh, I heard some Quakers one time in a church in Bethlehem, and uh, it was surreal because they were all hymns that you, you, you know and you sing, and we joined in with them, and they were surprised because I had young people and they were older folk. And then, of course, the Orthodox Jews with their, uh, with their psalms and their Friday afternoon, everything shuts down, and not even elevators work, and you better not drive a car either. It's a very surreal environment. You need to go one time in your life. Put it on your buckle list, because this ain't going to do it, okay? <laughs> this ain't going to do it. Can't take you in 45 minutes to all the places that are there, walking where Jesus walked. These are a couple of observations. We are privileged. I was two years ago in Athens, Greece, and uh, there was a, a group of um, Farsi-speaking and Arabic-speaking Iranians. They prefer to call themselves Persians, by the way. About 40 of them. 
And uh, they uh, asked, if they, I don't speak Farsi, so I used a translator on that occasion. And they asked if they could ask some questions. They came, of course, from a Muslim background, okay? And by the way, there is not an official life of Muhammad. I studied with a Muslim scholar at Florida State one time, and I do know as much as we can know about the life of Muhammad, but they know nothing. They don't do that. Here's a major difference between Christianity and Islam. They don't, it's not what you do and, and said, it's, it's just what he said. The Quran and uh, the other holy writings of that are, are the collection, when he died suddenly in 632 BC, AD, he, uh, of, the, of the, what the disciples of his put together that they remembered he said. And it's very hard to read, <laughs> even in English, and uh, it's not a narrative, and Mark is a blessing. <laughs> That's where I'm at, okay? And by the way, Matthew and Luke and John are too. What they asked me, and I tried to give them the best answer I could, was why in Christianity are there four why are there four biographies of the life of Christ? And the first thing you say, they're not in conflict to each other. They are in cooperation with each other. They fill in a picture because, as Luke says very clearly, at the beginning of his gospel and the beginning of the book of Acts, that wonderful history book of the first 32 years, it's what he did and what he said. God didn't just come and talk and preach and bullhorn us. He showed us. He didn't talk about servanthood. He did it. <laughs> And that's something that to a Muslim you got to stress. We have four biographies. And by the way, what's your favorite? <laughs> my favorite is Matthew. But my favorite chapter is Mark 15. And if I can end at the end, if you don't have any questions, maybe I'll just pull up a, a, a painting by a 15th century painter and uh, talk about that incredible crucifixion scene. It seems to me that the Gospel of Mark and there are many of you that could contradict me, and that's fine. I'm not a scholar in that area. He is in a fast mode of narration, and then suddenly it just woo, slows down when you get to the week that he wanted to tell you about the most, which is Mark chapter 15, when he talks about the crucifixion of Jesus. That one is an amazing aspect, in my opinion, of the book of Mark. Okay, Could, That is one of the early, by the way, pictures uh, excuse me, I went. got to go backwards. Here we go, right here. This is a Codex Sinaiticus found on the tip end of uh, well, St. Catherine's Monastery, and it has the first verse in Greek of, uh, uh, of uh, Mark chapter uh, 16. Uh, I know about the controversy at the end. We're not, that's not there right here. Mm -hmm. Somebody else can deal with that. Um, <laughs> it, it is, of course, about the fourth century that the book is invented. So instead of scrolls, you move to the codexes. And uh, we, of course, have made four major sources of the collection of the New Testament writings in Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus, uh, Codex Alexandrinus, the Alexandrian, the uh, Vatican one, and the one that was found in Sinai. God, in his manifold wisdom, let us find copies of the Gospel of Mark that date back to the 4th century and earlier in various papyri and many other things. It is the shortest gospel, okay? Maybe that's why it's good. Start there if you're uh, wanting to. Uh, this is an uh, icon of, I lived for a couple of years in Greece, and I've been there all my life. So it says, the holy apostle, the holy Mark, okay, in Greek right up there. To apostolos, to agios Marcos. It's the shortest gospel, often the first one to be translated into foreign languages. There are not many where uh, the Bible is not translated New Testament, but it's often overlooked because, of course, the larger ones of Matthew and Luke. And uh, uh, I'm not going to get in a discussion of authorship or of, uh, that's not my task, but it's possibly the first written because it has the fewest verses. Uh, Luke has, when the translators translated, added chapters and verses, 1,151 verses. Matthew has 10,071. John, 879. Mark has 661. You can read it in an hour and a half. So that's a good start for anybody that uh, doesn't know the life of Christ. And by the way, as I've taught it in various Christian colleges as well, I'm not... A, charging the church with this, but I'm saying it seems to me, it appears to me, and I could be wrong. Boy, I hope I'm wrong. 
that we're less literate in the life of Christ when it comes to our, our children and our young people. It just could be that I'm just getting old and I'm looking negative and that there's a golden age always before you, you know, uh, maybe, but uh, I see some, some vacuums in the knowledge. Pick a gospel, or if you're good at doing harmony, <laughs> I'm not, uh, uh, do, do harmony, but do it and uh, make sure that our next generation knows all that. They say that all but 31 verses uh, are quoted in the other Gospels. That's possibly why it's the beginning one. If it's around 64, then I'll remind you of the historical context. The church has been around for about 34 years, in my opinion. I started about 30 AD in the, in the, in the ascension of Jesus Christ of Acts chapter 1, and uh, because of the difference of chronology through the Middle Ages, okay? Um, and and uh, what, what we have is uh, the change of guard of who's persecuting Christianity. In the book of Acts, all of it, Rome is not the problem. Rome is actually defending or releasing. And by the way, even Pilate tried 10 times uh, to let Jesus go because he knew he was innocent. And he didn't want to have anything to do with it. What he did is ignore his wife, and that's a mistake, gentlemen. Um, <laughs> That's always a mistake. She even had a headache, so there you go. Uh, the point is, in 64, the emperor of the time, who had come to power in 54, 10 years before, Nero, Claudius Aquinas Barbus, he, uh, he had to blame somebody for a terrible fire in the capital of Rome. It burnt up about uh, three-tenths of the capital, the biggest city in the world, nearly two million people. It was a shanty town, and from his beautiful palace right by the Colosseum, Domus Aurea, the Golden Palace, he had a view to Shantytown, and he commented all the time he hated it. He was one of the most vilest, grotesque figures in all of human history. He, when he was a boy before he became emperor at 16, he uh, would bop old people on the head and throw their bodies in the Tiber River. That's from the historian Tacitus, who narrates that from the safety of 50 years after he committed suicide. You can't tell that story while he's still president, okay? You got to wait till he's gone. So there you go. He uh, assassinated his own mother, Agrippina, who put him in that place by giving a poison mushroom to the emperor Claudius, who is mentioned in the book of Acts, and died in 54. Nero, he blamed somebody. My opinion is that Paul had just come up for trial before him about two years before. So he knew about this Christian movement, as they miscalled it, misrepresented it. And he knew something, that it was a sect. And they were beginning to wonder whether it was legitimate or not. Rome thought they were legitimate up until 64. When Nero decided to uh, make it illegitimate, illegitimate, he set a precedent by Roman law. From that point on, you've got the beginning of persecutions, sporadic as they may be. The worst of one will come in the late second and definitely the worst one in the late third, right before the first emperor of Rome that we call C Christian, Constantine, legalizes Christianity in 313. So from about 64, right about the time that Marcus wrote, written, up until 313, um, uh, we have Rome who begins to be the one who's tightening the screws. Before that, it was the Jews. Over 40 times, he uses the word translated stray away or immediately. He seems to be in a hurry. Yes. There are several things in the pictures I'm going to show you. I say, why didn't he put this in there? Did he not know it? He's inspired. Nobody's questioning that. So what's in there is what needs to be in there. Okay? But one can ask, why did you leave some things out? Were you in a hurry? Well, he does use the straightforward or immediately. And by the way, if you, can, you can have this PowerPoint. It's not that good, but you can have it anytime. Over 40 times, he uses the word translated straight away in your translations, or immediately. I really like it when he says that about the miracles of Jesus, and he mentions about uh, 19 of them, by the way. Um, immediately. There's something uh, clear. There's about 10 things different between the supposed miracles today and the miracles of the first century. Um, and that one of them is it happens immediately. You don't have to wait around and check it out. It's something that, uh, you know, like in Acts chapter 
three, uh, you know, the lame man that's been lame since birth. He's over 40 years old. And Peter and John go in and they simply says, get up. And he hands him his hand for the first time in his life. He feels his ankles uh, for the first time in his life. Can't imagine that. Can't imagine that. Immediately, two-thirds of the verses begin with and. <laughs> What's with the and? Did they have a sale on ands, you know? Kai in Greek? <laughs> Would they have a sale on that? <laughs> no, it's because he was piecing together from the memories of Peter, inspiration still, uh, and, and and it was a good word to connect to the various parts. The present tense is used frequently. They come, he says, he sends, present tense, like it's happening today. He's writing it about 35 years later, but it's like it's happening right there. He prefers Greek verbs that portray something in progress, action that has effect, that continues. That's all, also part of the Greek that's there. Okay. Now, you know who he is. We're not discussing authorship. Who is he? He is, I start out, is he wealthy? In the Acts 12 representation, when we see his mother in the instance of Rhoda, do you remember Peter being let out? God steps into history and says, I don't think so, <laughs> and lets Peter out, and Peter in the middle of the night in Jerusalem is uh, knocking on a door. Where does he go? He goes to the house of John Mark. He goes to the house of the mother uh, of John Mark. It had a slave, Rhoda, and the question is, you know, how big the house was, and she had slaves, so uh, there you go. The, uh, excuse me, let me go back here. Uh, the young man who fled naked, that's, of course, uh, one of the suppositions. I don't know how you feel about it, Doug, but uh, it seems strange that the name would not be given or that it be mentioned at all unless it's very personal to the person that's writing. Um, he's a cousin of Barnabas. I've always wondered about that as I uh, have traced the footsteps of the Apostle Paul all my life. And I've been to many places except for his birthplace, and never been to Tarsus, because it's right on the border with ISIS. Something tells me not to go there right now, but, and uh, the uh, civil war with the Assad regime right now. But um, uh, Barnabas wants to trust him. Paul is absolutely disgusted, or whatever you call it. He deserted me is a term that's used in Acts chapter 15. He is not coming with me. That young man, let me go. I imagine a scene... Kind of like, uh, ever seen the movie Princess Bride, anybody? <laughs> There's a giant. He's climbing up. Okay, when they got to, in the, in the first missionary journey, uh, to the, the cliffs, of, uh, it must have looked like, okay, there's the cliffs and there's no giant, you know, to climb the rope. And the young man, of all people, said, I ain't going there. Where are we going? You know, 120 miles in the interior to the city of Antioch of Pisidia. I don't think so. What for? Paul's missionary methodology, his driving force. He may have been going there for a salve for his eyes as well. He says in the letter of Galatians, I came to you because of an illness. So that may have been the reason, but 120 miles and you have no giant to climb a cliff. That's probably why I think John Mark is going to convince us he was right in aborting that trip right about that time. But I could be wrong, okay? He's a fellow laborer. What comforts me is that at the end of Paul's life, when he writes 2 Timothy, he mentions Mark. And by the way, if Catholic tradition is correct, then Peter died too in the about the first persecution of Nero in the year 64 or early 65, something like that. Peter and Paul are said to be the two apostles that were killed among about 990 others. Martyrologies of the time, you can't count on the numbers, but there are archaeological evidence to the death of the two apostles uh, that were there. Why was Peter in Rome? I don't know. Paul, why did he go back if he was released two years before approximately by the Emperor Nero? I don't know. But a cataclysmic event, somebody probably was uh, fixing pork and beans in the shanty town of Rome, and it spilled over, caused a gigantic fire that then had to find somebody guilty. They were accused of setting the fire. They were innocent. Everybody knew they were innocent. But the grotesque abuse of power of Nero cost a life. But Mark was there. When Paul writes those final words, I have fought the faith, I've run the course. When he, he's, right, he's there together with Peter. There are some strange traditions that I'm just going to mention and then move on. Hippolytus of Rome says, no, he wasn't that guy. He was another John Mark, another Mark uh, that was one of the 70 disciples. We really don't have evidence for this, so I would simply say it's not, uh, it's not uh, legitimate. Eusebius, who wrote the first church history, uh, in, uh, Historia Ecclesiastica, he said he was picked up by Peter as a companion and translator on his way through Asia Minor. 
And uh, that's uh, a strong possibility. See 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1 there. You probably don't know this one, but there is a St. Mark's Cathedral in Venice. Hope you get to go to that uh, romantic city. What on earth is a cathedral dedicated to Mark doing there? Well, here's the weird story. You can't count on this at all. Okay, here it is. In 828, a relic believed to be the body of Mark was stolen from Alexandria of Egypt, who was controlled at that time by one of the Muslim uh, uh, caliph caliphs, uh, by two Venetian merchants with the help of two Greek monks and taken all the way to Venice. And then in 1094, the saint himself revealed the location of his remains. So there it is today. If you go visit it, that's the cathedral dedicated to the writer of the gospel right there. Now, do you believe it? No. <laughs> no we don't. There is a tomb in Alexandria of Egypt that's uh, dedicated to Mark. So uh, is he like, uh, say, for example, St. Catherine? The uh, uh, Catholic saint, St. Catherine, they got the head of her in Siena, Italy, and the body of her in Rome. So maybe the body of St. Mark fell apart and part of it's in North Africa. I'm just kidding. <laughs> don't, go, don't go there, okay? Peter calls him his son, kind of like Paul calls Timothy and Titus. Maybe they implied by that uh, Peter had a family, but he, he, he implies it's like my son in the faith. Maybe he baptized him. The widespread early tradition, you can count on that, is that it, he was an attendant writer of Peter. The earliest record we have of that is just after the last apostle dies, probably John in 95, Papias, who is bishop of Hierapolis, which is in Turkey, by the way, in Asia Minor among the seven churches, right by Colossae and uh, uh, Laodicea, who says he got it from John the Elder. He got it from the apostle John. So fairly reliable source right here that you can count on who was the writer of this gospel. Composed this gospel mostly from Peter's memoirs or sermons. This is what Justin Martyr says in the, about the middle of the second century AD. And uh, of course, I've already told you about the Orthodox tradition about him, but the cops who are the... Uh, in North Africa, uh, in, in Egypt, for example, there are 98% that are Muslim because of the jihadi invasions of the 8th century uh, AD. But uh, there's about 2% that are uh, historical Coptic Christians. They have some different, different understandings uh, of things, but uh, they say that uh, he died in Alexandria, and that's why that tomb is there in Egypt. He died a martyr in 68 AD. We're not sure of that at all. We don't have a lot about the rest of them. He wanted to, in his gospel, talk about discipleship. And uh, that's the main point. Here is, by the way, from the Codex Alexandrinus, one of the other early collections. And the chapters of Mark are actually in the last part after Matthew. There are the chapters of uh, the Gospel of Mark that you and I are uh, looking at uh, in particular on this particular day. He had some peculiarities about the way in which he wrote. His Greek is good. It's uh, not as good as uh, Luke's or definitely not as good as Hebrew. Hebrew letter, whoever it is, Barnabas or Paulus or, or Paul, it's outstanding Greek. But uh, Jewish customs are explained. So it's a Gentile audience that doesn't know all the Jewish customs. Aramaic expressions are translated into Greek. In Roman, time is used. In the Gospel of Matthew, for example, they will mostly use Jewish time, okay? They're not on the same boat uh, day and night, okay? Uh, the, how do you count time? And it's different. Only Mark, this one's very interesting to me. I won't say on it because I need to get to my walkabout, which I need to do, of Palestine. Uh, the father of the Simon, the one who's tapped on the shoulder when he, and told by a Roman soldier to take the cross of Jesus because he stumbles to, to Golgotha, okay? Why is it that we are told um, Simon was the father of Rufus, unless Rufus was a well-known Christian, and that what that leads me to believe is Simon, that tap on the shoulder of that Roman guard on that day, well, that made all the difference in his life. He had come for business from Cyrene, North Africa, uh, what we call Libya today. And what was he doing in Jerusalem? Was he there for religious reasons? Probably. Was he there for business reasons? Probably. But what he didn't expect was a Roman soldier to tell him, by the way, you need to carry this uh, distance. And that changed his life forever. That's just a supposition of mine. Hope that you can agree with that. Other noteworthy facts? He talks about the deeds. He, it's like he's in a hurry. Peter and Paul are either dead or, or we're losing him. 
And so the, the witnesses to the accounts, we need to put it in writing now. The last apostle, I think, will be John to, uh, you know, dis to disappear, probably around the turn of the year 100 in Ephesus. That's where his tomb is, at least, uh, in an Ephesus Basilica there. He records 19 miracles, but only four parables. So there are 27 parables, I think, between the four Gospels, but only four parables, okay? So his teaching has less of a place in this uh, shortest of all, but his, his miracles, and you're supposed to ask yourself, how can you do that, okay? If you're a Gentile, if you're coming from a Gentile, how, have you ever seen a real miracle? Hundreds of witnesses, thousands of witnesses, 5,000 fed, 4,000 fed. Go ask them. You can. They're still living, some of them. The deeds he will emphasize of one who came not to just talk, but to do and to be a servant and to teach us how to be servants as well. So here's our world. Can we, is there any way to turn some of these lights out and still see? Because it bleaches out a little bit. Thank you. I may, I may be asking for what you don't want here, but please feel free any time to stop me because question and answer period means the speaker can't kill the audience. <laughs> okay, but, and, uh, and luckily we've got comfortable chairs, but I'm going to walk you through as much as I can. Let's go back 20 centuries ago. In uh, God's manifold wisdom, as Paul calls it, it's the fullness of time. Paul can't believe that it's uh, his time when he was born. He was probably in the first decade A.D. But uh, here it is. Every, the world of that time, 80 million something people, is, uh, is owned by Rome. They came out of nowhere eight centuries before. They were absolutely Podunksville. Nothing. Seven hills in the middle of that peninsula there. But by the time of eight centuries later, they got 30 legions patrolling the whole world, and they have the biggest city in the world called Rome. And if you ever got to visit it, you'd be, oh, of all the buildings, eight-story high buildings in the Jewish ghetto, and of course, those entertainment centers like nobody had ever seen in their life. You know, Circus Maximus, chariot races, their version of NASCAR, Formula One, is a 250,000 seating, okay, just so you know. That's an eighth of the population, the biggest city in the world. Coliseum is Podunksville compared to that in numbers. It's 50,000, but you can have real live gladiator shows. You can have live naval battles because they can flood it halfway. And uh, also you can have wild animal hunts like bring in massive amounts of dirt. Nothing like Rome. Nothing's ever been seen like it. And God looked down into history and said, this is when. Uh, again, I've joked before. I would have said, let's do it. Why didn't he send us down the 21st century? We have internet. You know? No. That's not. Uh, he, 20 centuries ago. This is the world of the time. That's where the center of the earth. Look at this as a concentric circle. That's the middle. Everything's happening there. Politics, money, uh, military. The military machine of Rome, no one, they thought, they thought they'd be there forever, okay? And yet God sent here, and he's, in his plans, it's just 150 miles. And by the way, this is the Holy Land from about southern part of here. It's 150 miles from the southern part of Judah all the way to the city of Damascus. Once you hit Damascus, you're out of the, pro the promised land. You're out of the Holy Land. It's just 150 miles. You can drive that in two and a half hours if there were a straight street, straight road in, in uh in Palestine, there is not, <laughs> okay? Uh, you would have to go along the coast and then cut across or go on the other side because, uh, boy, it's uh, one different world here. This is the world where God sent his son. Jesus never left Palestine. Walk where Jesus walked. He never, never went. So imagine the fear of the apostles when at the ascension he said, now I want you to take everything I taught you and take it where? And they had never been out of Palestine either. Never. Uh, where, am I, where are we supposed to go? Mouse, mouse gaping wide open, you know, flies flying in. <laughs> going, Say what? Say how? We don't have internet. You know, how are we going to do that? So there it is. That's where the world, Nazareth, you know, right up there. Capernaum. Okay. And then, of course, Jerusalem. Okay. Birthplace Bethlehem. Two years in, in uh, 
in Egypt to make that parallel with the captivity of the children of Israel in Egypt and coming out of it. There's wonderful parallels there, there in it, okay? Now, here's the topography of the land I was just looking at. Uh, jokingly, I've said it's kind of like God uh, plays uh, Kung Fu and took a tomahawk chop right here, okay? This is 1,500 feet underneath the sea level, okay? This is the sea. This is 1,500 feet underneath it, below it. The Sea of Galilee up there, uh, which is about 600, 700 feet below the sea level, all right? Now look at uh, the mountains, okay? That's why I told you, you can't drive straight here. Look at this, okay? Mount Zion, where Jerusalem is, that's 2,500 feet. So from 1,500 feet to 2,500 feet, that's 4,000 feet, and you don't have a helicopter, okay? And you don't have a car, and you don't have a Mercedes Benz bus. <laughs> what you got is feet and donkeys, and that's about it, okay? Not more than that. I went through each of the chapters of Mark, and I looked at, okay, where did Mark record from the notes of Peter? Um, you know, where in each chapter, where was he? Obviously, I can't cover in these last 20 minutes, but I'm going to cover just as few as I can. Some of them are by chapter, kind of, sort of, and I'll get to as many as I can. You can fill in the rest. You need to make a trip over there. Not because you'll find your faith, but um, it will make your faith come alive. I dare say that for some, you'll preach it differently. Not because you've found a truth, but because it just makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up when you walk down Mount of Olives. I hope that you can. I know Gary has. Raise your hand if you've been there before. Fantastic. Am I telling the truth? Okay. You will be torn, sad for the Palestinian West Bank, checkpoints, modern Israel, what are they supposed to do? And you will also see the only solution to this is, you know, well, Jesus, that's the only solution. He came to give peace. That's so ironic because the main mantra of the first emperor of Rome when he was born, Octavian Augustus Caesar, who ruled from the year 31 B.C. to 14 A.D., 45 years nearly. The mantra of the first emperor of Rome was, I bring you peace. And he made, ordered, constructed in downtown Imperial Rome a, a monument to peace called Pax Romana, uh, Ara Pacis, the altar to peace. He said he brought peace, but he didn't. He was talking about politics. As long as we look for solutions in politics, we're going to fail. The only one who is the real prince of peace, as Isaiah said, is Jesus. That's the only one that can do, settle our politics for us when we all become others. Um, I want you to think of the journey from here to here. That's where Jerusalem is. That to right there is about 12 miles. That's where he starts. He starts with John the Baptist. I'm reading, at the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, and then verse 4, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness. He starts out in a quick fashion. He doesn't talk about his birth. He doesn't talk about the years in Egypt. He doesn't talk about, he's already an, an adult. He's already 30-something years old. He skips, you know, got to get to the week in history that matters the most, which is his, uh, you know, tri triumphal entry, uh, sparring in the temple with the uh, Pharisees and Sadducees, and then his surrendering the Garden of Gethsemane, that tragic kiss of Judas on the cheek, and then, and then, of course, those six trials, all of them illegal, especially the Jewish side, and then, of course, he allowed himself to be pierced through, uh, didn't call on the angels, and it was on that cross about seven hours on that Friday. I am, again, supposing some things there, and then, of course, there's that feeling that the, the, the high priests and the, and the Pharisees and Sadducees had. Did he say something about he'd be coming back? <laughs> the apostles were scattered in a closed doors behind a, a place in Jerusalem hiding. They were scared to death when they had run from the Garden of Gethsemane. But they remembered he said he'd be back, you know, and to their greatest, you know, fear. You know, 16 Roman soldiers, however many, come running at them saying, uh, we've been trained to fight men, but angels, we don't do, okay? And, uh, and so they said, we'll pay you to tell a lie. And Mar Matthew will say that lie has been still fed to people 35 years later. You know, what a lie this is. Now, look at the distance between, I want you to, there and here. That's 4,000 feet, like that, 
okay? Or down, it's the other way. When he starts out telling you about John the Baptist, he picks up right there in about the year 30 AD, or 27 AD, excuse me, and John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, is, uh, is, has come away. He is living in the desert area. Uh, this is supposedly found by an archaeologist that has kinda, I'm skeptical of it, a cave of followers of John the Baptist. John the Baptist will come baptizing the Jordan River. Why on earth did he go 4,000 feet from Jerusalem? Why didn't he do it in Jerusalem at the Temple Mount? There were uh, nearly 80 to 150, some archaeologists say, mikvahs, which are baptismal pools, where all the thousands of people in Jerusalem, nearly 200,000, every day when they wanted to go to the Temple of God, had to do ablutions, which is not for the forgiveness of sins, but so you can wash away your impurities and go into the house of God ritually clean. Why didn't John do them in the temple? Because he wanted to make a separation, a distinction. And by the way, it's not the Jordan River that's, uh, you know, the issue. Is that the cave of John the Baptist? I don't think so. Did he wear, uh, did he eat strange foods like locusts with honey? You betcha. By the way, they're not bad, but I wouldn't recommend them all the time. I've tried those out. <laughs> Grasshoppers, so, you know, <laughs> there you go. This is what probably the most famous painting of the baptism of Jesus. That's where he starts in chapter 1. And it's, of course, by an a, a Italian painter. This is famous because of this angel right here, which was painted by a guy you may have heard of, which is Leonardo da Vinci. He was 13 years old. And by the way, that is totally theologically and historically incorrect. <laughs> okay. All right. This is not John the Baptist. He's only six months older. Looks like he's had a hard life out there in the desert. And he's <laughs> pouring a bowl of water. Sprinkling started in the 4th century AD. We have evidence in the Christian catacombs of Rome. It's a, it's, a, it's a misinterpretation, mishandling of the whole concept of immersion. John went out to the Jordan River to distinguish from ablutions. This is for the forgiveness of sins. And by the way, the kingdom of heaven is coming. Kingdom of heaven is coming. He's preparing the way. The precursor, right? John the Baptist, that's here, okay? Why didn't he talk about how John the Baptist dies? Did he not care about John the Baptist? Uh, Herod the Great, in his uh, tragic, terrible 30 years of rule or more, he had grown up in Rome. He's a Herodian dynasty Jewish king, Idumean. The Jews hated him. He had built with their money that he stole 22 palaces, one of which was right here, Machairus. The best that we can tell, as we are told about the death of John the Baptist in, in Matthew chapter 11 or 12, I can't remember right now, but uh, is that uh, he, that party, the birthday party and the, and the drunkenness and uh, the, uh, you know, he liked John the Baptist, but because he promised in front of all these people, he had to follow through and all of a sudden you got on a silver platter, a, uh, you know, head of an innocent man who was the precursor. When Jesus hears about it, you remember, he is saddened. But God is sad. <laughs> Because no better man, what compliment he pays to John the Baptist. Macaruelos. Why didn't, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask him, why didn't you tell us about Macaruelos? Why didn't you tell us about the grown up years of Jesus? This is Sepphoris, about four miles across the valley from Nazareth. Nazareth was probably a town I can't show you much except what it is today, which is different. I can't show you much uh, about uh, it, but uh, four miles across the valley, there's the, the very impressive ruins of Sepphoris, which was a Greco-Roman city with a lot of entertainment and, and construction projects. Call him whatever you wish. I call Jesus construction. That's what I think he did, okay? Uh, meaning, there's, you don't build tables and chairs in Palestine of the first century. They don't do that. But what they do is a lot of construction, the Greco-Roman world. In Sepphoris, Joseph may have taken his eldest son and then his other four sons. We know of four sons, of course, and uh, he took his sons to work. They were a big family. The um, Jews didn't do abortion. You know, they were the only ones in the world didn't do abortion. But does that sound familiar? <laughs> the only ones. And, uh, and this is a city with uh, mosaics and entertainment centers and a stadium and all that. D did Jesus help construct some of these items? In those years that are silent, Luke 2.52, right? Um, uh, he grew in, in, in favor and stature with God and man, okay? Uh, is that what happened between the age of 12 and his father probably passed away and he, he became the main guy to lead there? This is where 
the Jordan River is. It comes in to the Dead Sea, the lowest body of water in the world, saltest, saltiest body of water in the world. Jordan River is freshwater course, and the uh, Jordan River starts way up in uh, Mount Hermon and springs there, and then pours into the Sea of Galilee, then it goes down, and uh, it just made, reminds me of the importance of water, you know, and the crossing water. You know, in the biblical narrative as a whole, you know, you got the flood, right? You got the children of Israel fleeing from the Egyptians, and uh, God parts the waters, okay? And then he covers them back up. You got the children of Israel coming across the Jordan River. It's not that big a deal. Look at its widest point sometimes. It's like this. You know, this is towards the north. There is a spot now where evangelical Christians, evangelical friends, uh, have made a place where you can easily go in and rebaptize yourself. I tell my students it's not a necessary journey you need to make. There's nothing magic about that water, but to realize the historicity of uh, the, 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 the small river, we have much bigger ones. <laughs> you know, it's not the size that matters. It's a matter what happened on the banks of that river. That's what really matters here. There is the Jordan River as it goes into the, uh, the Dead Sea. It's a desert area. That's where I think John the Baptist was. Forget the cave, okay? He was in a desert. If you want to go hear him and he will chew you out for the way you've been living and you need to repent and do a different thing, you need to go 12 miles downhill, okay? Go to a desert area, okay? And then after you're done, you got to go 12 miles up. Why does John do it there? Because you need to work for this. This is not, you need to think about this one. How long does it take you to do 12 miles down and 12 miles clearly up? It's a good thing it was up after they've been baptized. What do you think? Okay. Here's the Judean wilderness. Wow. That's Jerusalem way over there. You're coming up that. You're coming up. That's the area. They're not kidding about that. Looks like a lunar landscape, okay? Still today, even though they have highways, and you can drive it for those who have been there. Why didn't... Mark mentioned, you know, the mention of the temptations is very quick, brief, you know. He doesn't mention the way in which Satan, you know, attempted to. But the third right here, here's a model of the temple at the time, and it's in the book of the, it's in the Museum of the Scroll in, uh, in um, Jerusalem. And it's 150 feet from what is called the Royal Stoa, 150 feet all the way down to the bottom. It's the southeastern uh, corner of the 13-acre uh, temple and that was being finished right during Jesus' day. Why? That's where Satan took the highest point of the temple to have Jesus. Just throw yourself down. The angels will catch you. Remember that? He didn't mention it. There it is. Capernaum. He just... Talked about Capernaum. He doesn't say, oh, by the way, Jesus, when he came out for his ministry, went to the Jordan Desert to catch his cousin, was baptized, and then he changed address, okay? And he didn't tell the post office either. So there you go. There's a synagogue of Capernaum. The Jews will rebel in 66 to Rome. Rome will come four years later and destroy them, the temple, in 70 AD. They will rebel a second time in 132, what's called the Bar Kokhba Rebellion, and the Romans will say, okay, that's it, we've had it. You, were, you lost your uh, temple to your only God, you're the only monotheist in the world. You lost that the first time. Second time, they kicked all Jews out of Palestine, kicked all Jews. In one, by 135, no Jews are left in Palestine, none. Dispersion to the max. Okay? They already had dispersion. In that Roman world that I showed you a map of, there were about 6 million Jews, 80 million pagans approximately, 6 million Jews. They had more children than anybody else. No abortion. Okay? And they tend to stick together. Since the time of the Babylonian captivity, they had founded this institution that's not there in the Old Testament called the synagogue. There is a synagogue right there. It's a school Sunday through Friday, and then on Sabbath, it's the worship center because most Jews are not close to Jerusalem. They're far out in the world. By 135, they're all gone from Palestine, all gone completely, and it's uh, un unimaginable, and all their synagogues are destroyed, every one of them. Even their schooling centers are destroyed in Palestine by the Romans. They obliterate a Jewish society. We told you once. Now it's the second time, and there you go. This is where he moves to, Capernaum, or Kafarnaum, as it's called now in Arabic. And he moves about 30 miles from Nazareth to 
Capernaum. This was about 400 people, the best we can estimate. By the way, there was a source that I have not given you called, um, it's a brother in Christ of ours, actually, that I know of, Richard Beatty. He talked about the, the city of, the forgotten city of uh, Sepphoris. And uh, I did give you uh, the latest uh, to get a lot of this information from uh, N.T. Wright. He's an Anglican uh, professor uh, at Oxford now and a Don in uh, this is the <laughs> definitive <laughs> work. It's a door stopper, and, but it has a lot of pictures in it, so you'll be happy about that. Uh, so, uh, in, in, the, in the reading. This is where he moves to. Why? This is about 400. This is about 1,500. So it's about three times the size. More importantly, it's right on a major road, and that's where uh, we are at. There are houses. They're made out of black porphyry rock, and, uh, uh, you know, the house of Peter is what my Catholic friends identify in here. That's, I think, gobbledygook. It's fourth century tradition. Uh, meanwhile, but uh, no evidence of it whatsoever. But this is the city where many of the miracles, a lot of the teachings, he will get mad at this city. If I had done the miracles in Tyre and Sidon, he will say, you know, they would have been more receptive. You, I've done 30 miracles and you want one more, one more, one more. How, what other evidence do you need uh, to this effect, okay? Uh, for those of you who've been there, have you been to see the boat? Found in 1970, good. In the uh, drought year of 1970, whatever it was, uh, the Sea of Galilee sank and suddenly they saw a skeleton in the mud. The mud had preserved the wood. The wood was going to disintegrate in two seconds flat when they tried to move it. So they constructed a special styrofoam vehicle by which the Jesus boat, as they called it, uh, is a first century fishing boat. And by the way, uh, we didn't have any designs or archaeological mosaics of it or whatever. And it seats about 15 people. Let me think. 12 apostles plus Jesus. How that many does that make? Is there room for Jesus to lay down during a storm? And catch a nap. Is there room for that? There it is, the Jesus boat. This is the Sea of Galilee. This is his stomping ground. He doesn't go to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is where the Sadducees rule the temple and the Pharisees rule everything else. They are in charge. And the Sadducees, for sure, want status quo. They don't want anything to change. They don't want a Messiah. They're not going to read the prophets. <laughs> While the Pharisees do read the prophets, know that there's supposed to be a Messiah coming, Okay. But uh, they don't want him to come now. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like uh, yesterday I had to preach in my little congregation on 1 Timothy chapter 4. The early Christian Aramaic saying for hello was, Mara Natha, how do you pronounce it? I don't know, Aramaic. You know what it means? It's happened twice, 1 Corinthians 16 and Revelation at the end. May the Lord come, and you can add another verb of time if you want to, soon. Do we mean it? May the Lord come soon. May he come today. You know, may he come today. They didn't, want, they didn't want the Messiah to come. The Pharisees didn't. There is the Sea of Galilee. There it is seen from a Google map. Here it is right up here. Eight and a half miles wide, six, uh, long, six and a half miles width. It's about six, 700 feet below sea level. And when I was there last, uh, I had a surreal event. That is, I told a boatman to take my group out so we could revisit and read the scripture from uh, the, the gospels and the events that happened on that water. And suddenly he turned on the motor while I was talking. It was quiet, it was still, and he turned the motor and I thought, he's never done that before. I wonder what's going on. And he started uh, taking off. Then suddenly he picked up the speed on the motor. And I thought, what does he know that I don't know? <laughs> and suddenly, whoom, the oh, waves started coming up and they weren't there. It was like a sheet of ice before or a sheet of glass. And suddenly we made it into port just to care. The, because it's so low down, off the mountains of the country of Jordan, the place where Moses is buried, Mount Nebo, whoom, when uh, they decide to change the temperatures <laughs> pretty rapidly, the uh, possibility and the sailors and the, the fishermen of that time, right? Uh, Mark records the first four called, right? They were all fishermen by, by profession, right? 
I, I have to wonder if they knew how to swim. Uh, surely they did. <laughs> but uh, they're not going to swim through uh, one of those squalls. A squall had come up, and I was reminded of the historicity of, of, the, of the Bible again in this particular setting. Here is a view of the cities that he will spend a lot of time and a lot of miracles in. These are Jewish cities, Chorazim, Bethsaida, and uh, Capernaum. The four fishermen apostles, I think, are from Bethsaida, which, by the way, is, uh, excuse me, I need to go back, sorry about that, is uh, uh, over on this side right here, well, Capernaum on this side. So the three major cities up there that are going to get well, the woes of Jesus because he spends so much time and miracles and they still want, want more, well, that's where that's going to happen. So let me move on here. Here's the view. So you need to go. Sit down on one of these hills. Read Mark. Take an hour and a half. That's what you need to do. Nazareth. Today, it's 70,000 uh, Muslims. It's a Palestinian city. And I'm out of time. There's the Church of the, the Holy Annunciation. Um, this is an excavation that's being done in the last few years on first century Nazareth houses. 400 people at the most, 70,000 today. The only active, with a sign outside, church in the Middle East that I know of is here. You need to pray for Maurice Chaton and his wife Iman because he is in these 80s and he has two sons that went to Freed. One of them are both, both. And uh, they are there holding up the fort. You can't evangelize publicly. You can't in a Muslim city, even though it's Israel. You can't do that. But you, they are the only ones that are allowed to have a sign outside. Go there. Encourage them. Visit. Tell them you hang in there. You know, do you feel privileged to have all the support like we have right now? We can freely come together like this and evangelize publicly too? You can't in Nazareth. How sad but that's part of Islam as well. He's going to talk about the parables. Who's going to talk about the parables? Yeah, the cove of the parables. I don't know if historical, but I know that it's interesting to see that you can have a little boat in what's historically the cove of the parables just south of Capernaum towards Tagbatha, or Ta Tagba. And it's right here. And the acoustics in this little place, you can sit on the edges, the acoustic from the boat. Jesus was looking in the second and third year when the crowds were assailing him early in the morning to late at night. He was looking a place to rest. And instead, they came all the time. And uh, so he, he came away from the shore and was speaking to them. One day, he totally talked about parables, right? Matthew chapter 13. And his apostles saying, what's going on? <laughs> okay, you've used them before, but I mean, all you did is parables today. By the way, uh, we don't get half of them. <laughs> okay, well, what's going on there? He has to explain some of them, okay? Why did you uh, upgrade your teaching method to a teaching system, the parable that already existed? He didn't invent it, but he perfected it. He's the master teacher. And he said, listen, I've been talking for a year and a half. I'm, I'm putting words in Jesus' mouth. Watch out. <laughs> and uh, they're not listening to me. So I'm going to make it harder for them to understand. If you want to listen to me today, my preaching just went up a notch. Okay? So you're going to have to use your thinking cap on this particular day. There it is. He will cross over to the other side. The other side, the capitalists, that means 10 cities, a Roman organization of of the area, okay? There are the cities that are Jewish, the green. On the other side are where, well, bacon and pigs are, <laughs> okay? <laughs> That's where they are. And of course, somewhere here, it can't be Gadara, it has to be near close, the 2,000 pigs go running off into that area. This is the area on the other side of, it's in the country of Jordan, by the way, uh, in modern day times. He will feed 5,000. There is in a catacomb of Rome, one of the many, many times in the 40 miles of underground cemeteries of Christians when they, they put miracles. They, they, they believe in the resurrected Christ. The most important word is anastasis, which is resurrection. That defines everything. And by the way, a cemetery, it comes from the Latin word cemeterium, which means dormitory. And uh, th things they're buried in, they're called locally, which means beds. These people are in a dormitory. They're sleeping until the big alarm clock comes. At the end of time, it's called the second coming, the advent. That's what they believe. What do we believe? May the Lord come soon, right? May the Lord come soon. Here it is right here in Mosaics, the miracle, the day that uh, he fed 5,000 people yeah, with uh, loaves and fishes. This is a Catholic church, 
um, the first time that somebody Christian, and I'll use that term loosely here, came to Palestine to look for sites of Jesus was the mother of Constantine. Helen was her name. Now, she identified a lot of places that are questionable, okay, because it was by tradition. Well-meaning Christians wanted to, to believe in those particular places. So some of these are like the Sermon on the Mount uh, site. It's a beautiful site. There's a Catholic church. Um, Catholic nun there allows me to have our group sing in their chapels there, uh, and uh, they uh, appreciate it. But uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure of some of them because... Again, sometimes we want to find, well, Noah's Ark or the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, I'd love to find those. Wouldn't you think? We'd make a museum out of it. <laughs> We'd put it in Kentucky. <laughs> okay. So, there you, go. there you go. He will go to Tyre and Sidon. Why do you go there? I'm walking through. He goes there because these people over here, Bethsaida, Capernaum, and... and uh, uh, the, the third city, are uh, not listening. So he goes to the Phoenicians, to the pagans. Syrophoenician woman is healed here. He will go up here to these areas. Briefly, he will step out of when he goes across the Sea of Galilee or when he goes to Tyre and Sidon on the coast, way down on the coast, he will step into pagan territories. But I guess it's surprising to me, I don't know about you, but Mark and all the other synoptic gospels and John record demon possession among the Jews. Why is, why is demon, why is the devil finding fertile territory among the Jews for demon possession? Uh, one of the most remarkable ones is Mary Magdalene, of course. She had seven demons, but uh, the rest of her life, which is the one that matters, is she's the first one to see the resurrected Lord, and she serves Jesus and his apostles and her entourage. She's there at the cross, all of the above. Magdala, this is where she was from. Here's a Jewish menorah, and here are ruins that are being excavated at the city of uh, Mary Magdalene, uh, the first one who saw the resurrected Jesus, accompanied one of the many women that accompanied the apostles in their trips. Three times during his ministry, he goes from, from Capernaum down to Jerusalem, always on the biggest feast of the Jewish holiday, the Passover. That's an eight-day feast, by the way. There is in the north, he goes to Caesarea Philippi one time, which is where a pagan god Pan, one of the most uh, disgusting gods of all the many disgusting gods of the great pantheon uh, were up there. He goes up to Caesarea Philippi. He has transfigured in the Gospel of Mark. That change, this, like the spiritual body that you and I will have when the end of time comes, you know, uh, there are, you know, the representation of the law, Moses and Elijah and the prophets, and uh, they're, they're, in disem they're in bodies of some kind. Peter, uh, J James, and John see them. There is uh, the Mount Tabor, which is said to be the place where there's a Catholic church on top. Again, m many of these were built in the 18th and 19th century, few in the early 20th, in the sites that Helen identified. Another option is, because it says in one of the Gospels, he went six days, and it could be Mount Hermon, which means I better take your skis with you up there because it's quite high. This is the church on Mount Tabor, which is in the plain of Galilee, and just like God went like this with his hands and formed a 1,900 feet tall, tall thing. I'm out of time. He will go beyond the Jordan. He will then go towards Jerusalem. He will come to the city of Jericho, all of these are mentioned in the Gospel of Mark as he's in a hurry to get to this point right here. The triumphal entry. The, the, the baby donkey, you know, not coming in like a triumphant Roman general, okay? Got to make sure they don't misunderstand. I didn't come here to get rid of the Romans. That's just politics. And by the way, that's not what I'm about, as he will say. So here it is, a triumphal entry with a Hosanna, son of David. He wants to tell you about that, Mark does. Here's a procession in the Kidron Valley, which is coming down from the Mount of Olives. It's one in the early 19th century, and, uh, early photography. And there's the Temple Mount way up there, and that's a procession. Imagine an entourage of Jesus coming down from 
from uh, the coming from Jericho, coming from beyond the Jordan, actually, and then coming down and entering Jerusalem. And the nightmare that it was right before Passover uh, to the Pharisees and Sadducees. Me to arrest him. By all accounts, the arrest orders of the high priest Cephas had been there for over a month, but they missed him because he threw a kink in it and came down to them. And he had crowds, and they couldn't, they couldn't do stuff with the crowds around him. They couldn't. The crowds loved him, all of that. This is the city of Jerusalem in the first century AD, and uh, there's a wonderful model that those of you who have been there have probably seen, and it, it helps you to envision that. But uh, here are... Uh, a couple of things I'm going to show you as we finish right here. Golgotha right there, question mark. Where did it all come to that tragic and amazing conclusion? You know, tragic the way it had to be and amazing the way it ended, you know, with the resurrection day and anastasis, okay? Well, it's either there or to the north period where you see above the other part of the wall, Fortress Antonia. That's where a thousand Roman soldiers were right there in Fortress Antonia. And uh, that's where I want to go. Here's the model of the 13 acres of the, of the temple. And here is the royal stoa. And here on this side is the, the Solomon's portico. Here's the nine story high Holy of Holies. And there's the, where the entrances, there are 16 of them. This is on the uh, east, uh, west side. That's the north side, east side. Forget the bench there. And uh, this right here, two, two big entrances. And you could come in through the big entrances. Most people in Jerusalem came twice a day at nine in the morning, three in the afternoon, came through here. But if you were a Gentile, there's a sign right here that says, no Gentiles passed here, penalty of? Absolutely. And who does security in there? The, the, the temple guards do. The Romans are right over there having cappuccino right here. They're, they're at, they're at uh, you know, Starbucks. They're, they get called only if the people inside don't do their job. They will not allow anything to happen. Luke, Mark stops and slows down and gives us every single detail in Mark 15 and tells us absolutely everybody that was at the cross. There's Jerusalem today. Uh, Muslims conquered it in the 8th century and built the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Haqsa martyrs. There are two major mosques. This is 11th century. This is 8th century. This is a mixture of uh, era, uh, Muslim graves, and then across the valley in the Kidron Valley, there's, a, um, there's a Jewish graves, and they both share this. The Muslims control the top here. The only thing left of the Jews at the time of Christ is the Western Wall, as it's called, or used to be called the Wailing Wall, uh, all of the above. So there it is. There is a reconstruction of it in the temple. So there is. There's the parapet that says, don't go past you if you're a Gentile. Don't go past you if you're a Gentile. Okay? And there is the, I think the door, Nicanor door, beautiful gate that's mentioned in Acts chapter 3. Here are the Romans who are going to save the life of Paul when he gets assaulted by a mob inside here because they think he took a Gentile in past the wrong, wrong courtyard. The Garden of Gethsemane. There are very few olive trees left. I love olive trees. Growing up in Italy, I had a lot of them that I had to take care of, and an Italian gardener named Antonio taught me how to do that. There are low branches, and I can understand how in the dark of the night, with the silvery leaves of an olive tree, that you and all men wearing beards, and short hair, by the way, uh, not long hair, that's an artistic tradition, that you wouldn't know which one was Jesus, and you want to rest the right one. So the ultimate act of betrayal, what is it? A kiss. Got to give him a kiss. Otherwise, we'll arrest the wrong guy. There are some olive trees that have survived not only centuries, but millennia. This one right here may be from the time of Christ. There's a little bit of it left over from that time right there. There is the Mount of Olives. There's the Dome of the Rock. There's the Temple Mound. There's the um, uh, Arabic graves. They're closest, to the Muslim graves, they're closest to the site. And then I'll stop right here. This is the Matthew 15, this is by a Mantegna, an artist. It's not very realistic. In the 15th century, they didn't have a, um, a, uh, they didn't have a uh, model of Jerusalem of the first century. But he, they, so it's, it's partly reconstructed. There's Jerusalem in the background back there. See it? Here are the women, the soldiers, 
all the people at the cross. To me, one of the most effective preaching moments for, for, uh, for uh, Mark is uh, chapter 15, where he slows down and gives you everything to do, time of day, everything. Why? Because it's the most important moment in human history. Forget everything else. Most important moment in history. And by the way, it ends in the most amazing way with that resurrection day. I'm way out of time, so I'll stop. Comments. I'm not going to ask for questions. <laughs> Add on, please, if you would. How do you spell that artist's name? Mantegna, M-A-N-T-E-G-N-A. I will, uh, they have the PowerPoint. You're welcome to give it, but please, if you do, make it better. Do something. <laughs> Oh, wow, it kept you a long time. Okay, any other comments or questions? You need to get up and get some coffee. Let me recommend N.T. Wright's. I found one thing I disagree with him. He thinks there's an Ephesian imprisonment for Paul. I have no idea why. <laughs> I don't see much evidence for that, but uh, prison epistles I put in Rome uh, for various reasons, but uh, maybe you do too. They were written from that uh, uh, rented apartment in Rome, not a dark dungeon. Um, the dark dungeon will come two years later when he writes Second Timothy. Anything else? Thank you very much.